Welcome attendees of iOSConf Singapore to my final talk of the conference about continuous integration for the rest of us. Every project benefits from a good continuous integration and delivery system. And while there's countless articles on how the latest Swift or Swift UI tricks work, there's surprisingly little talk about strategies around CI and CD. You will find case studies by industry giants like Spotify or Uber that talk about their solutions. However, their CI CD team in many cases is larger than some middle-sized companies. At PSPDF Kit, we don't have a separate team for CI CD. Instead, our engineering team also owns testing and delivery. Now in this talk, I will give you an overview over the options today and will explore what paths we took for fast automated testing in a multi-platform environment. We'll also talk about money because running at cost is an important topic for bootstrap companies. Lastly, we look at options around configuration management tools to automate machine setups. So you see the structure is split in four sections. We're discussing our CI requirements. We're discussing CI orchestrators and spoiler, it's not Jenkins anymore. Then we look at the workers, the machines that actually run your tests and what options you have there in terms of virtualization or using bare metal. And lastly, I'll give you a quick tour over the landscape of configuration management tooling and show a few snippets of the one we ended up choosing. Now, what we're not discussing here today is how to write stable UI tests. While this is usually a fairly easy topic for model testing, it gets incredibly complicated once you start doing UI testing. And this topic can fill many, many, many other talks. So if you're interested in learning strategies there, check out one of my recent talks at App Builders last year on UI testing, where I introduced various frameworks and open source project that can possibly help. Now, who am I? My name is Peter Steinberger, and I live in beautiful Vienna, Austria. That's also where I'm talking to you today from this remote conference. Uh, I started working with iOS with version 3, and I love working on difficult problems. I founded a company named PSPDF Kit. We offer a, PS, a PDF SDK for all platforms to show documents, annotate them, fill forms, and also, of course, sign documents. Now, we started on iOS, but now we offer an SDK for all of the major platforms, from Android to Windows to the web. And this is relevant because one of the requirements for our CI system is that it, it can't just work on mobile. It also needs to support Windows and the web. Now I'm tweeting a lot about my work on Twitter and I also have a personal blog at stipe.com. And especially over the last few months, I've been improving our CI infrastructure and also with a series of blog posts on our company blog. And this talk covers a good part of the series, but there's more articles coming out. As a preparation of this presentation, I've been working on two more posts that cover CI orchestrators and um, configuration management tools, which will be released in the next few weeks. As an attendee of iOSConf Singapore, you'll hear about it first. Now let's discuss our CI options here from the lens of our company. We are a middle-sized business with about 50 um, people, most of them engineers. Our code base is around 1.5 million lines of code. And we run tests on every pull request and for different versions. So it's for iPad, iPhone, iOS 12, 13, 14, uh, ideally also with Intel and Silicon architectures. So 10 concurrent builds would be the minimum to work somewhat sane in such a setup. Currently, we actually have 25 agents. Now, in regard to the 50 people number, our org is very engineering heavy, but of course the number could be reduced. However, it's nice to not have friction there and just allow everyone in the org to access our CI systems. Now, for a CI system, we expect great integration with GitHub first class container and Docker support for our web SDK, powerful pipelines, so we can not only run tests, but also ship apps and build more complex test setups 
And lastly, yes, it also should look great. So let's explore what, what type of CI orchestrators are there. There are roughly three types. There's the pure orchestrators, schedulers, um, solutions that include build runners and tools that offer both their own runners and self hosted agents. Now, almost all of these tools are hosted in the cloud. Some optionally offer an enterprise version that can be hosted on premise. However, this is usually quite an expensive option. If you look for an open source solution, there is Jenkins and there is GitLab. Hosting your own solution also takes DevOps time. So ultimately, you also need to factor this into your expenses. Now, it's actually quite tricky to find statistics on what people shipping Mac apps or iOS apps use a CI system. I did find a survey from 2018 that Mac Stadium did. Now, they are a dedicated Mac hardware hoster and thus host a lot of workers that are used for CI. But of course, people that use CI systems that come already with workers will likely not be represented in this study. You still see that Jenkins here is leading by far with almost 60% usage. And there is no clear winner on the remaining tools. Now, I mentioned it from 2018, so the statistics was done before GitHub Actions was launched. But since this is quite a young solution, I don't expect it to be used widely just yet. In PSP DevKit, we started with Travis CI, but quickly realized that performance isn't good enough. So we experimented with a few other solutions, such as the infamous body build um, that's not been killed by Apple, or Circle CI, but they also were similarly slow. So in the end, we chose Jenkins. We started using Jenkins for CI CD at PSP DevKit in 2013, and it served us well for many years. As we grew and released more products, we eventually went to limitations and started looking for other solutions. There's a lot of good things to say about Jenkins. It has a large community and it runs on any platform, thanks to it being written in Java. It does, however, require a significant amount of maintenance and it has various architectural shortcomings that make it difficult to work with. Our main issue were around updating either plugins or Jenkins itself. Without a staging Jenkins instance, it's really easy to crash the complete instance when updating one faulty plugin. As a result, uh, the appeal to try and improve our Jenkins CI uh, was really low. And along with this came a general risk that we break our production. Installing a plugin also required a restart of Jenkins, which meant all the ongoing builds needed to be stopped. Now, a Jenkins instance contains of a large number of plugins that are all developed and updated independently of each other. This leads to available plugin updates every few days. Despite those updates, we got the impression that the Jenkins ecosystem overall is slowly dying. A lot of the plugins rely are either barely maintained or not maintained at all. Now, the Jenkins web UI is also configured via complex web forms and editing changes in bulk was difficult. As not every setup is supported via the newer Jenkins file concept that would allow configuration in the source code repository. Another option that is popular in the mobile space is Bitrise. They were not listed in the Mac Stadium statistics as it's a full featured solution that comes with its own Mac OS workers. The hardware you get there is either a, a two virtual CPU setup with four gigabyte RAM or the Elite version with four virtual CPUs at 3.5 gigahertz and eight gigabyte RAM. They charge around $3,000 for two concurrent builds, and each extra concurrent build is around $1,200 per year extra. Now we stopped the evaluation there as the hardware isn't powerful enough for our needs. There is no support for Windows, and they don't allow integrating of external workers. Another popular choice is CircleCI. They are multi-platform, and as of late 2019, they also support Windows. Now, the macOS hardware there is either 4-core CPU with 8GB RAM or 8 cores with 16GB RAM. However, the 8-core version comes with a note that this resource requires review by our support team. Circle prices per user and also per build minutes using a quite tricky credit system. Um, a large 
like the the one that requires consent by support is a hundred credits per minute. You get twenty five thousand credits to start with. So if you do the math, this ends up being a little over four hours. So if you say you would need CI for an average of five hours a day, you come close to paying uh, nine thousand dollars per year for their service. Even with the possibility of eight core machines, we were at the point where we really wanted to own our hardware and there is no support for custom agents at Circle CI. Now we also quickly looked at Team CD by JetBrains, which is an extremely powerful continuous integration system. It doesn't come with agents, so you bring your own. The professional version is free, but to meet our requirements, we would need the enterprise version, which comes at a whopping 29,999 euros. Uh, initially and 50% of the hedge each year. The high price and uh, the feedback, <laughs> the feedback to be honest, uh, the people said it looks almost as bad as Jenkins, made us not investigate anymore in this option. Now, GitHub Actions is one of the newest CI systems and works beautifully with GitHub, obviously, as it's being a feature of GitHub. It makes perfect sense that GitHub is investing into the CI space. The macOS workers offered are quite slow, so you only get two cores, seven gigabyte of RAM, and fourteen gigabyte of disk. However, they also offer both uh, the hosted options and support for self-hosted runners. We did our initial evaluation and move in 2019, where this product didn't exist yet. If you would start all over again from scratch in 2021, we'd first look at GitHub Actions before potentially choosing another system. And of course, there's also GitLab. GitLab is a competitor of GitHub and they have a very, very sophisticated CI system. It is possible to create complex pipelines out of the box. They do have a few years head start compared to GitHub Actions and the product feels pretty mature. The agent is a single Go binary without any dependencies and it also supports monorepos, which is a thing we use. Um, now, as I said, GitLab is not just CI, it's, it's more similar to GitHub itself. So it does sync the complete repository to enable its CI solution, which means it's getting all our source code unless we host GitLab ourselves. This makes sense as they are a competitor, but it's unattractive when one is not really interested in moving away from GitHub. So clicking on a commit in the CI job will take you to GitLab instead of back to GitHub, which is one of the examples how they, they try to change to GitLab completely. Now, at the time of evaluation uh, in 2019, it was not possible to see JUnit results, which is something we use. We, we convert the results from Xcode into JUnit format, so it can be nicely displayed on our CI system. Now, the good news is that uh, between our initial evaluation and now, they actually implemented this feature. Pricing is quite reasonable with around $19 per user per month for the silver plan, which is probably enough for most people. But it is significantly more than the $4 per user per month that we currently pay for GitHub. Since we have no interest in moving away from GitHub and it lacked an essential feature back then, we ended the evaluation there. If you start a new project in 2021 and you are free to choose where you host your source code, this is a really, really interesting choice. Now, BuildKite. BuildKite is a pure CI orchestrator. They don't offer any hosted machines. However, there's currently a trial run where they do experiment with offering CI workers. Uh, however, this is in early access and there's no information available around performance other than an ominous up to 30% faster than other CI CD providers, whatever this means. Um, the system is simple but it's easy to extend with your own hooks. Pricing is $15 per user per month. It supports GitHub and Google single sign-on. It comes with an extensive API, including GraphQL and webhooks. You can create pipelines dynamically, which is something we use for the monorepo, um, where we use a pipeline and which triggers new pipelines depending on the changed files. The agent is a single Go binary without any external dependencies, so it runs on any platform. They even were super quick to offer a version that runs natively on Apple Silicon. We found a positive case study by Pinterest where they moved from Jenkins to Bullkite. And completing all of that, it just checked enough boxes that we went with it. It's not cheap, 
but we decided it's worth the price. And we did make the switch in 2019 and now using it a little bit more over a year, it's been really fantastic. We used a standard plan for around 8k dollar per year. The self-hosted version would start at 36,000. But both the service in the cloud and the agents are extremely reliable and the whole category of CI issues that we had where sometimes an agent would just freeze uh, on Jenkins are gone. One of the things we miss is an overview over which agents are running on which jobs are running on which machines or um, to prioritize a job. But none of that is really essential and overall it's been a really good upgrade from Jenkins. Now let's talk a little bit about maintaining your own build agents. We have this requirement to ensure our tests are fast. Waiting more than 15 minutes for CI isn't really acceptable and this is fairly impossible with our requirements unless you have really beefy hardware and a caching system. Both things you only get if you maintain your own machines. And overall more, the issue with macOS is that while it runs, it does run great on PC hardware, anyone who has tried Hackintosh or read about it knows that. However, Apple requires that each instance of macOS runs on only original Mac hardware only. Now, virtualization is allowed, but again, while there's no technical limitation why you couldn't use a stock Dell Linux server, put VirtualBox on it and run macOS in there, this is against Apple's Euler. Um, there's different arguments on the legality of that, but as a company, you don't want to operate in gray area. So every virtual machine you work on will and has to run on real Mac hardware. This, combined with the fact that they don't really make server hardware, is compended and then you understand that there's a lot of challenges involved. They actually did make a, a, a server product, the Xsurf line, but it was discontinued in 2011. Yeah. Um, when you run your own hardware, you still have a choice. You can use virtualization so you build one image and then run that on any number of machines or you use bare metal hardware. We look at virtualization first. There are three commercially solutions available on the market that can legally virtualize macOS. There is vSphere by VMware, which uses the VMware hypervisor. There is Orca by Mac Stadium and there is Anka by Virtu. They both they all use a different technology, right? So VMware uses the VMware hypervisor, Orca uses KVM, uh, which is a popular Linux-based hypervisor, and Anka uses a different approach. They use Apple's hypervisor framework. So it runs on top of macOS itself. VMware is the oldest product around, uh, and Anka and Orca are newer technologies being released in 2017 and 2019, respectively. I've been trying to evaluate, <laughs> or at least looking at it, uh, and the only one that you can really try is Anka. It has the best developer setup. You can download their software, you can build an image, and you can test everything on your machine. Ultimately, each of those products supports imaging, so each of them will work. However, they also don't come free. There's a performance and complexity overhead when you use it. And from talking to many folks, if you decide to go with virtualization, currently Anka seems to be the best choice. Now, of course, it's also possible to install macOS with just open source uh, using KVM yourself, but this requires a lot of dedication and tricks. So if you factor in time, it's really just one of those three solutions. Virtualization isn't all roses. There is issues that you need to think about. For one, uh, there is a performance penalty. Every solution that puts layers between the US and hardware will give you a performance penalty. It's, it's hard to measure exactly how much it is, but reports go from twice as slow to a mere 10% overhead. Your VM setup might also be otherwise constrained. Maybe there is poor networking. Uh, there is a performance variation if you have different workloads on other VMs. 
for example, Spotify. They wrote a blog post about that, how they moved from VMware to bare metal in late 2019 for performance reasons and especially for a more predictable environment. Uh, Lyft also moved to bare metals for very much of the similar reasons. Now we had performance, there's also bugs. Uh, with an additional software layer, you will inherit bugs. There's a report of memory leaks, VMs just getting stuck, and unreliable USB pass-through. And in cases where the company relies on the system hypervisor, like Anchor does, there's only little, there are only limited ways how you can work around bugs if there are any. Now lastly, there's compatibility. Um, if you rely on virtualization, you will delay adoption of new OS versions, such as the Big Sur or Apple Silicon update. As the vendor first had to finish updating its product first, and new features might also cause issues. For example, the, the iOS simulator uses Metal for acceleration in Big Sur, but none of the virtualization solution support a virtualized Metal graphics card. Uh, we are true, however, is working on that. Now there's also the issue of pricing. And I haven't found a single write-up that actually takes price into consideration when you consider macOS virtualization. This is in some ways understandable because in the larger companies, engineers are usually uh, not involved in pricing decisions. So ever for smaller teams without venture capital, it's an important metric. Total cost is difficult to measure since the promise of virtualization is less ongoing work, which would translate to reduce ongoing maintenance cost and often employees are the most expensive cost factor. Now, there's also no public pricing for any of these services available. However, if you Google around, you'll find people discussing the price quotes. So uh, take what I say with a grain of salt and, and just inquire with those companies yourself. But given that, Anchor charges around $600 per core per year. If you do the math and you take 10 Mac Minis with six cores each, that translates into around $36,000 per year. I assume they offer discounts if you reach a certain number of costs. You can assume that Orca and VMware operate at a similar pricing range. All of them use bespoke offerings. Now, while virtualization and the ability to distribute images is attractive, we were not ready to invest such a large five-figure sum just in the virtualization layer. You know, there's also the hardware that you need to pay. We also often see issues with the iOS simulator and the prospects of having yet another layer that could introduce bugs was not attractive. We also need to be quite cutting edge with our SDK, especially because we also offer a catalyst update, which requires an OS update and no vendor for virtualization software is as fast as we need them to. And we're not alone here. Even large companies such as LinkedIn, Uber, or Ditto move to bare metal. You can find some links or tweets to that in our blog post series. Another question is hosting. You can go ahead and buy Mac Minis and host them at your office, but chances are you want the data center to do it for you. They take over the task of replacing hardware if something breaks, allowing you to increase or decrease hardware on demand. So to list some of the most popular choices, there is MacWeb uh, with around $1,600 per year. MacStadium's current offering for this setup is around 2 k a year. We have Flow with around 5 k a year and we have Amazon with almost 10 k a year. Amazon is also the, the newest one in the Mac server game. The usual payment terms is monthly. Um, with only Amazon having actually a minimum level of 24 hours. And the 24 hours doesn't, is not coming from Amazon, um, but it's actually enforced by Apple's Euler. So here's Apple again uh, putting up weird rules that increase pricing for CI. Um, another factor is you also want to trust your data center. I haven't heard much about MacWeb, but uh, from the other three partners, I only heard good things and I can recommend each single one of them. Uh, now keep in mind, this is a pricing for one machine. It's, you need to multiply it by 10 to see what the price is for a 10 concurrent build requirements. The beauty of self-hosting is also that you can move really fast. We've been itching to try moving to Apple Silicon machines as soon as they came out. Uh, and there's only a few providers that offer them currently. It's a really attractive target for ZI because it promises 30% 
uh, promises to be 30% cheaper than the Intel one and also has a better performance. We actually end up having a mixed mode setup with both Intel and Apple Silicon machines. And you see the prices there are really attractive. Now, of course, new hardware is also problems. So updating our scripts to set up uh, Apple Silicon was quite easy. And indeed, the tests run faster with iOS 14. But we also support iOS 13 and iOS 12. And here the simulator actually runs in Intel, which means it, it requires emulation, which actually makes the tests that run 30 to 60% slower than you do on Intel machines. We also see an issue where something in the simulator leaks. Um, if the machine runs a lot of jobs, eventually the simulator hangs and doesn't boot anymore, which is fixed with a reboot. Now, there's another issue where if you have something with WebKit, it will crash unless you run it on iOS 14. The attractive part for us was that it really found architecture-specific bugs in our code base that didn't happen on Intel. So overall, this is a, a great machine. The software is slowly getting there. I re recommend maybe waiting another six months until you try that. I have a, an article about um, the workarounds on my website if you're more interested in that. And to show you a little bit of code, I know I have a presentation without code. This is a, quite unusual for me. Um, I did mention that the WebKit bay tests crash on Apple Silicon. Now, we worked around that. How would you go around detecting that? Uh, Apple offers a new uh, syscall called syscontrol proc translated, which allows you to detect if your app runs in translation mode. So we currently use that to just not run any WebKit-based tests if we detect that they are in a Rosetta environment. Now, of course, this is just a temporary solution, and based on the radar responses, I assume that this will be fixed in Big Sur 11.2. And, of course, this is only for tests. Don't ship this in production. Now, people have also been asking, what about the Mac Pro? Um, we experimented with them, but to be honest, for the price of one Mac Pro, you get easily 6 to 10 good Mac Minis, and if you really want to use a Mac Pro, you have to use virtualization software. So um, I don't see how this will actually be a better bargain for you. If you have unlimited money, of course this is better, uh, but they're really, really, really expensive. So um, there was an article that even Spotify experimented with Mac Pros, but they only got around 30% more performance for six times the price. All right. We now talked a lot about CI systems, picking the right service and choosing the right hardware and potentially a virtualization layer. And once this is done, you'll need a way to create your macOS image or set up your macOS machine. This can be done manually, but it will take you a long time and you will likely make mistakes. And this is also the biggest downside of running a bare metal that each machine needs to be set up manually. And you want to have the exact, in exactly the same way, otherwise there might be weird test issues. Now, we mostly automate the process via a configuration management tool. What remains is OS level updates, but this is small enough that it can be done without a dedicated person managing CI. Another upside is that the configuration scripts serve as documentation and can be reviewed just like code. Now, there's... Um, a bunch of popular solutions such as Ansible, Chef, Puppet, and Salt. They all offer a way to script the installation of macOS, creating users, installing Xcode, and so on and so forth. At PSPDFKit, we chose Chef to automatically provision macOS machines. Chef uses receipts written in Ruby that specify actions. And since we already use Ruby for pretty much all the scripting in our company, it was a great match. A uh, receipt defines how Xcode is installed or how to add a new user. And many receipts create a cookbook, which can be run to automatically, automatically provision a node. We used to use Ansible for a while, but Chef was attractive because it's much easier to solve problems in a real programming language for the YAML configuration used there. 
Most other companies settled on Chef as the hackable solution. Microsoft, Uber, Pinterest and Facebook all have open sourced their Chef receipts. So you have an incredibly useful set of almost all the actions that you want to automate. Plus, everything is kept up up to date, so moving to the new S release is really simple. Now, a small gotcha there. Chef is open source, and in April 2019, uh, they changed the model from an open core to being completely free. And everything was relicensed under a patch too, and while the announcement reads really well, in the fine print it says that now Chef is no longer offering binaries, and if you want the binary, this is $150 per node per year. In response to that, the Sync project was created, which is a free alternative, and they offer binaries. However, it cannot be called Chef because of trademarks, so ultimately you need to just download Chef from Sync, and then you have to gotcha that sometimes configuration options are called Chef, and sometimes they are called Sync. Um, it's slightly annoying, but overall it's not that bad. So again, if you want to get started with Chef, the best place to look for is Microsoft's Chef Cookbooks. It's MIT license, and it comes with a wide variety of receipts. Uh, one of them, for example, is Spotlight. And to give you an idea, this is how uh, the Spotlight script reads. It's, it's, it's quite a simple wrapper. You see that ultimately it calls MDUtil and it wraps everything nicely. So you can write code like this. You see we split it into two parts. Uh, there is the defaults and then there is the actual uh, receipt where we just turn off Spotlight for our volume that contains the source code, which gives us around 5% additional performance. Uh, this is code that will delete unnecessary apps, so we have more disk space available for caching and temp files. This is code that I wrote myself, uh, so I've not written a library, uh, I just call out into the shell and disable a screensaver. There is a fun bug in Big Sur that if you're on the logon screen and the screensaver turns on, you sometimes cannot disable the screensaver anymore, uh, so better that you disable the screensaver for every user and also for the logon part. Now, installing Xcode is as simple as that. Under the hood, this uses the Xcode install gem. And what's especially nice is that it also installs all our simulators, which usually is very tedious if you have to do that by hand. Now, Chef traditionally uses Chef server to run cookbooks. I know, yet another component. Um, we decided not to use this. Instead, we use a tool called Knife Zero. It runs the Chef cookbooks via HTTP over SSH port forwarding um, instead of the Chef server. This is greatly simplifies running it, and it also allows you to check in the node configurations right into the source code. To run a command on all agents, you have you don't need Knife Zero. This is an, a built-in feature of Chef. You can just use Knife SSH, uh, put up a filter, and run the command. And um, I'm doing this uh, almost live, and you see how fast it is, and it shows on all our nodes which Xcode version it runs, and we are good, we run latest everything. And that's what it is for today. Let's quickly revisit what we have discussed. We talked about um, CI orchestrators and BuildKite. We talked about managed for us self-hosted runners. We talked about virtualization for us bare metal. And we talked about configuration management tools and ultimately why we picked Chef. And that's it for today. Thanks for listening and see you soon.